Welcome to Discipling Nations with Pastor Ryan Briccio. Pastor Ryan's heart is to empower you and your family to walk in the power and blessings of God. Your life will be forever changed. Now, here's Pastor Ryan. I feel like God's going to sovereignly come on some of you during the service in some way. What that looks like, I don't know. Maybe you might feel heat in your hand. Or you might feel tingles in the back of your neck or your chest might get hot or your stomach or something. If you feel the presence of God coming upon you as I'm sharing, I just want you to stand up for just a minute. Right, yeah, right while I'm talking, just stand up and I'll point at you and say, I bless you in Jesus' name. And then you can sit back down, okay? I really want you to do that. So don't think, I don't want to interrupt him. I don't want to become the focus of service. It'll just be a second. I'll just point at you and you sit back down and pray for you. But... Um, God, God wants to do this. I really believe this. Think about the life of Gideon. He was called to do this major ministry, and here he was hiding out in this wine press. He didn't. He was like he saw himself like the least of his family, the least in this community. He's hiding. He's terrified. And after this encounter he had with God, whenever it happened, he's leading a man, a, a group of three hundred men, into battle against a hundred thousand men or more. With three hundred, I mean, how did he go from hiding? to boldness. Think about Peter. They're in the upper room. They're hiding. The 120 of them says they were hiding because they were in fear for the Jews. They're going to come after them next and kill them the way they did Jesus. They're in there hiding. Then Acts chapter 2 happened, and all of a sudden the windows are flung open. There's a crowd of 3,000 people plus outside of the window, and Peter is the main one preaching the message, and the 3,000 plus were added to the kingdom that day. He went from terrified, scared, intimidated, oh no, I'm next, to boldness came upon him. What happened? It was the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit touched them in such a way. Same thing happened with Moses. Same thing happened with, you look at all the characters in the Bible, I'm sure they had some kind of encounter like that because we can't do the things that God is asking us to do without the help of the Holy Spirit. We can't. Just no one can. Amen. So I want to tell you a few stories of how uh, this ministry of, I don't know what you call it, just the ministry I'm in, how it got started for me. I grew up in Canada, and you guys, I think, all know that. And I was in the Bible college of my grandfather, my dad, and my mother went there for a year or so. I had aunts, uncles, and cousins there, my brother. A bunch of people went through there. It was family. And uh, a building named after my grandfather. My grandfather taught there for, I think it was 27 years or something like that. Taught Greek and Hebrew and some other stuff. But um, I wasn't going to go to that school because I didn't want to go there just because my family did. I wanted to go if only if God told me to go. So I had this time of praying, seeking God's face for a while, just asking God, what do you want me to do? And then one day, as I was, I was walking my dog, I stopped at this spot along the water, and I just sat down at a picnic table. I have a picture of Taylor and I years later at that same picnic table. Um, and just prayed, God, what do you want me to do? And I've been praying about this for, I think, about six months or so. And that day I heard God speak, I want you to go to that Bible college, and I want you to take youth ministry. And I want you to stay there until I, until I tell you to leave. And he had to tell me that because once Holly came and left, I wanted to leave too. But <laughs> I wasn't allowed to leave just yet. So uh, over time, then my senior year came along. And I was very unhappy. And I was happy and unhappy because I met Holly in my junior year. Then she went off to school in New York. And it's about 17 hours from New York to, to New Brunswick where I was. And I saw her rarely. I mean, you go from spending all this time together to see them, like, I don't know, a few times in the year. I've called her a lot, though. My dad's mom's phone bill was like $2,000 because they didn't have the cool phone plans they have nowadays. It was long distance. Yeah, they were, that was my wedding present, they told me, when they forgave me of my debt. There's your wedding present. We forgive you of this debt. I'm like, well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, thankfully, they really loved Holly, too. But I, I was just had this unsettled unhappiness in my heart of, just, I missed her. And, um, and then on top of that, I had a really difficult summer. I did my internship at, with this pastor who was from England. No offense to <laughs> Julia, but this guy was a, a stereotypical staunchy Brit, not that they're all the, just the ones that they, like the ones they show in movies. That doesn't, what? Yeah, it was more than that, but he was prim and proper. But uh, very, very strict. And I had multiple pastors come and warn me, do not do your internship with this man. He will, he'll crush you for the summer. And I'm like, but Holly lives like 35 minutes away. <laughs> I'm like thinking, I want to I do it there. So I did. And they, but they were right. He, I, I was literally crying the first day there. Because this guy just 
my first day, I didn't get my bags unpacked yet. I had to live with this guy for the summer. And he uh, just, I don't even remember what he was saying, just what's your plan for the summer? And I told him some things I hadn't planned. And, and he was just like, I'm working with the teenagers too, right? And so he's like, I had a plan to do a camp out and some different things like that. He goes, so fun, fun. All you want to do is fun, right? Is that all you want is fun? What about like, like, I'm working with teenagers here. What do you want me to do? Like, yeah, I'm in car wash. I mean, what do you want me? To, I mean, but he was just very, very strict. Uh, my very, my first uh, time was to preach a sermon. He said, here is your text and here is your, uh, here's your title of your sermon. I want you to preach this sermon this Sunday. Before you, before you uh, preach it, I want you to write out every word you're going to say in this sermon and then hand it to me by Friday. And then I'll go over it with you on Friday and we'll, I'll tell you if this is okay for you to preach to the church on Sunday. I was like, okay. I'm like, wow, gosh. I mean, so anyway, so I'm in there writing every word down I was, thought I was going to say, everything down, and I don't remember how many pages it was. And I turned it into him on Friday. And the guy sat, he had, he had his doctorate degree in, I think, engineering or something like that. Very smart guy. And he's like, uh, but he's, he's going over my grammar in this thing. And I'm, <laughs> this, that's why it's hilarious to be out of that book. Because <laughs> that's never been a strong point for me. And so anyway, uh, he's all these different spelling mistakes. There should be commas and all this kind of stuff. He's pointing out everything that's wrong with it. And I'm just feeling like beat up. Like just beat up by this guy. And I'm like, well, is there anything good with it? And he's like, well, yeah, all the stuff I didn't mark out. Well, thank you very much for the compliment. That's what I was like. He's like, I'm sorry, I don't have the gift of encouragement. I'm like, man, you can't use that for excuse. The Bible says to encourage everybody as long as you see it is today. Encourage them daily. You can't, there's no gift of encouragement. Find me the gift of encouragement in the Bible. And he didn't know what to say. But, but I I'd held back for weeks and weeks of this guy just beating me up with his words. Breakfast was at 7.30. My shower was at 7 on the dot. It was like I was in boot camp. I mean, he just, I was living with him, and he had all this extra stuff for me to do. And by the time I finished that summer, I remember driving down the road when I finally left, and I cranked up some tunes like, hallelujah, I'm free from this crazy place. I mean, I really did. I love the kids there, but he just beat me up all the time. He, we drove through town, and he'd tell me, these people are saved. This people's not saved. They're not saved. They're saved. He thinks he's saved, but he's really not saved. And it was just this very critical spirit on him. I remember him telling me one day, if you're going to succeed in ministry, let me tell you this one thing. This is key. He said, don't trust anyone. That was his big tip he wanted to give me before I started ministry was don't trust anybody. And I was thinking like, man, this guy must have been really betrayed, backstabbed, and wounded. To, 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 that's his advice to give me, not pray a lot or read your Bible a lot or something. It was, don't trust anybody. Like, so how do you stand up and preach to people if you don't trust them? I don't know. But anyway, so by the time I left, I was, oh, yeah, I did this one more thing because it's crazy. The youth didn't want me to leave. I really loved them. They loved me. Uh, and um, one day, the, the last day I was supposed to leave, I didn't lock my car, which was, it was a country church just like this. And uh, I mean, no one locked the doors of the cars or anything. And the teenagers took, pulled the spark plug cables out of my car, like all of them, and then threw them on the floor because they didn't want me to leave. And you, I guess you got to put them back on in the right proper order or your car won't spark and won't go. And I'm putting them on. I'm doing the trial and error thing and nothing's working. And they get mad at me for not locking my car because I should have been more responsible to lock my car because I should have known that they were going to do that. And I'm like, okay, all right, my fault, my bad, or whatever. And I just, just felt punched and beat up like the entire summer. So when I left, I, was, I remember saying in my heart to God, I said, God, if this is what ministry is really like, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. I can't take it. If, this is, if, I, if I'm this beat up for the, from the summer, it's only like two, three months, how am I possibly going to do that for my lifetime? I can't do it. So I went home, and I was feeling that kind of beat down, discouraged. Holly was gone. I got involved in sports and stuff to keep myself busy. But deep down in my heart, I just still I wasn't happy. I just something. I just knew something was missing, and one day God spoke to me. He said, uh, "He said, Ryan. He said, How come I'm not enough?" And I said, "I don't know. I know you're supposed to be, but clearly you're not right now for me. Um, I don't know. I don't know. And of course, he knew I didn't know the answer, but I, I, I remember it so clear. How come I'm not enough?" And so I'm like, "Okay, uh, I'll try. I don't know. I couldn't fix that. I mean, I still." I know he is, but in my heart, because I was feeling what I was feeling, he didn't feel like he was. So I started noticing people in my school that were different than me. It's funny, looking back now, um, 
I just thought they just had stronger leadership gifts or they had stronger anointings or on the worship team or they're in leadership and different things. I started noticing them. And uh, I noticed a pattern like, yeah, I think, I'll, I think every one of them used to do drugs. Maybe that's what... <laughs> I really, I remember thinking that totally. Like, uh, I think all of them used to do drugs before they got saved, uh, except for maybe this guy. But the rest of them all, like, no, that's not. The guy's like, no, that's not what I was trying to show you. <laughs> but anyway, you're trying to figure it out. I'm just a very logical reasoning thinker. And um, one day I realized that all of them were the only ones in the school that were baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now, whether they prayed in tongues or not, I don't know. But they were baptized in the Holy Spirit, and uh, didn't have a grid for that. Didn't know what that meant, what it looked like. I didn't. No one talked about it. All I knew from my school is if you did it, you're probably going to get kicked out of the church. Or if you're a pastor and you did it, you're probably going to be asked to leave because it was something that they said is um, not to be promoted. So I was like, okay. So, uh, But I kept noticing these guys, and I get around them. When they talked about the Bible, it felt different than when other people talked about the Bible. There was a passion there and different things. So anyway, uh, on th it was Thanksgiving. I believe it was 95, I think it was. I went to go see Holly in New York. And, of course, Canadian Thanksgiving is different than the American one. So I had some time off. We went there. And a uh, car broke down on the way and uh, just a whole big adventure. But anyway, we were already engaged at that time. And uh, I, was, I was looking for a job, potential job for the next year at the Salvation Army. I was hoping to be like a rec director in sports and stuff like that, just to do that kind of thing. And I knew some people in the Army that could help me pull some strings and stuff. So I went in there early. On the way out, when I came out of there, I saw this group of men praying around the flagpole. It's called the Liberty Pole, if you've ever been to Rochester. And it, um, they were praying around the pole. There's like 10 or 12 guys, white, black guys, big, tall, all different, uh, just a variety of people, 10, 12 people. And I remember I was across the street looking at them. I'm like, I wonder what those guys are doing over there. It looks like they're praying. And I'm thinking, I wonder if they're a cult or what's going on. What, what are they praying? So I said to my buddy Kevin, I said, why don't we go closer and just listen to what they're saying? So we got a little closer, and they're and they praying, and, and some of them are praying in tongues. Now, I've only been in one other service in my life where they prayed in tongues, and I ran out of the room and about tripped over, I, well, I did kind of trip over a chair. Didn't fall, but I made a big noise. I wasn't trying to make a noise. It was those metal chairs, and they clunked together. I'm like, oh, sorry, guys. I didn't, anyway, freaked me out. I was scared. Uh, I was, you know, you can be scared in God's presence. Looking back, the very thing that scared me back then is the very um, presence of God that I go into my prayer room every day and spend time with him in that same presence that scared me back then because it, it was different than what I felt. So anyway, I, I left there. Now, I'm, now it's, I'm in New York. I'm at Rochester around this Liberty Pole. And um, they're here and praying the Spirit. And I was just about to start like tiptoeing kind of off like, all right, I'm out of here. These guys are weird. I'm leaving. And then a guy looks at me and said, do you want to join us in prayer? And I meant to say no, but I said yes. And after I said yes, I was like, what did I just say? How did I, why did I say that? I want to leave. I want to get out of here. These guys are scaring me. I'm not comfortable anymore. And so I said yes. I'm like, oh, great. Now i got to get in there. So I got in closer around this circle. We started praying. I did my quiet prayer. They are praying for the city and different things like that. And we um, weren't praying long, and all of a sudden this man looked at me, and he says, you have the gift of healing. You're going to heal the sick and raise the dead. Nobody talked like that in any circles that I've ever been in in my life. And um, normally I would have been like, I know I would have been like, okay, see you later. And this guy's really crazy. I am going. I'm leaving. But it wasn't so much his word, but my spirit started burning. I mean, it was burning. I, I've never, I never felt that before like that. It was burning. I, it was like I couldn't move. He kept saying other things to me, and he's prophesying over me. can't remember any of those. just remember he said that first part. And so uh, I went home. Anyway, found out most likely those were not real men. Most likely they were angels. I, ca I called the numbers they gave me. I wrote the letters to the, the address they gave me because I knew I'd be back the next year to go when she had more school to do. And I never saw them again. I ended up working like a block or two from that flagpole. They said they met there every Thursday at noon. I never saw them there. I went by there multiple times. I parked my car close there and watched. And... They, I never saw them again. So every time I prayed about it, God told me they were angels. And that moment, it altered the course of my life. Not, not just the word. The word was good, even though I didn't know what to do with that word. I mean, how do you heal the sick? How do you raise the dead? I, I didn't even saw anybody healed of a headache before. I mean, I just didn't even see people praying for headaches anymore. Like, it was just something like, we don't do that. That's, that's just back in Jesus' day. That's just back then, you know. 
So um, I went home from there, and my, and my life was changing. I, I got this hunger in my heart, like, oh, i got to find out what the Bible says about healing, because I really don't know. So I started studying the Old Testament, New Testament. I remember one day I went into the new computer lab with the dot matrix printers and the paper feeding through and stuff like that. It was brand new that year, and the uh, Internet was brand new. And uh, I got this Bible program. I typed in healing, and I, I hit print on all the verses in the Bible that had to do healing, heals, healed, or something like that. I thought there'd be a handful, maybe a couple pages or something, and I went outside to play basketball. I came back quite a while later. The thing was still printing. Well, they did print a lot slower back then, too. But, you know, just really slow, the thing rolling. And uh, the, the lab tech was mad at me. He said, what, are you, what did you print? He goes, are you printing the entire Bible? Said, Look at all the paper you're using. You're going to have to pay for this. I'm like, I'm sorry. I'm like, I'll pay for it. I had no clue it was in there as much as it was in the Old and New Testament. So I started reading these verses and other verses, highlighting this and underlining this. And I was studying it for weeks, a couple of weeks anyway, just studying on my free time. And just had all these questions for God, like, why did you put all of this in the Bible? Why did you put that in here? Why, why do I see in every, almost every page in Matthew, Mark, Luke, Luke, and John, and Acts, miracles, crazy miracles, stuff that we've heard so many times that doesn't even shock us anymore, that Jesus is walking on water. He's raising dead people. He's, like, cleansing leprosy, and he's touching lepers. Like, if you've ever been around, the smell alone would be something to knock you over. He's touching their skin with his hand. He's doing all these things. I'm like, God, how come I was seeing these things on every page, but I never seen anything like this in my life? And I, I didn't have an answer. I didn't hear anything, but the hunger was there. So uh, I'll skip some of this story because I'm not really focused on the healing side of this. I'm more focused on the encounter. The encounter with the burning in the Word caused me to study the Word to find out what God's saying. I'll tell this one quickly just because it's fun, but anyway, that night I asked God that question, didn't have the answer, went back, uh, I was like, you know what, I'm tired of studying. The, even the Word of God says, much study will make you weary. And I was weary from studying. I said, I'm going to go up to the student center and play pool with my buddies, just hang out, watch the TV, do something relaxing. It was Friday night, went up to the student center, and I walked in, in the door, There's, it's kind of like a upper lower kind of duplex where they're downstairs there's pool tables and stuff upstairs there's tv and a hangout place and and then the stairs going up and down and there's a landing spot in the middle and i come in the door and uh, there's a girl to my right name aaron and she had tore ligaments in her ankle from playing football or soccer <laughs> playing from soccer and uh she was a physio that day couldn't rotate her ankle at all without serious pain and so i walk past her and as soon as i walk past her i mean the last thing on my mind was that god might ask me to pray for somebody it was just thinking I'm going to go play pool. I'm, I'm tired of studying. I don't understand this healing stuff. I walked past her. I clearly heard God say, not out loud, but as loud as you possibly could internally, pray for her foot. I looked around like, pray for whose foot? I'm like, oh, oh, Aaron, okay. And I kept walking right on by her because my heart's thumping like this. I'm like, pray for her foot. You want me to pray for her foot in front of potentially all these people and stuff like that? And I'm just like, I'm nervous. I'm scared. I don't know what to say or do. And I finally said, I, I was motivated by guilt. My, my relationship with the Lord, because I didn't understand the grace of God, was a lot of motivation from guilt. So I knew I'd feel really guilty later and wouldn't be able to sleep good that night if I didn't do what I knew that he said. So it wasn't I cared a rip, honestly, about her ankle. I knew she's going to get better in six to eight weeks anyway. I just knew that if I don't do this, I'm not going to be able to sleep later. I'm going to feel bad. I mean, just telling you the truth. I mean, that's, I, that was my thought process. I'm walking downstairs in circles trying to think what I'm going to do with it. So I walked up to her and I told her, I said, Aaron, God wants me to pray for your foot. And, uh, and I just walked past you. God said, pray for a foot. He wants to heal your foot. And she started laughing because no one in my circles prayed for people like that. No one expected things like that. And I was kind of a class clown. I, did, I was kicked out of classes multiple times <laughs> for stupid things and stuff, as you guys couldn't possibly imagine. But, <laughs> but anyway, uh, I said, no, I'm serious. I walked past you, and God said to pray for your foot. And so she said, all right, well, pray for my foot then. Then I was like, Oh, great. Now I don't know what to say. I've never heard anybody pray for someone for healing before. So I reached down, touched her foot, and I was like, God, heal her foot in Jesus' name. And I jumped up, looked around, made sure no one saw me, and I was like, all right, good. I can sleep well tonight. I'm good. So I was like, how's your mom doing? Anyway, how's your, how's your sister? And just started making small talk. I was just going to make a casual conversation so it was a timely manner that was not awkward enough to just leave and say goodbye. I was stretching out a bit. And then she goes, wait a minute. My ankle doesn't hurt anymore. And I'm like, Aaron, don't even mess with me. 
And she goes, oh, I'm serious. Uh, I said, well, rotate your ankle. So she rotates her ankle. There's no pain. My heart's speeding faster and faster. And I'm freaking out internally. And I'm like, okay, well, walk up the stairs without your crutches and come back down. And so she walks up the stairs, comes back down, and uh, no pain. And so I said, all right, Aaron, let's test this out. <laughs> go to the third step, jump down, land on both feet, and tell me how you feel. I mean, she was in physio that day. I've had that injury before in ba from basketball, and the bed sheet hurt my foot. Like, it, it was like crying pain, like it hurt a lot. And so um, she does, to her credit, she does. She listened to me, had no idea what I was doing. She goes third step, jumps down, land on both feet, and boom, and no pain at all. I'm still like internally freaking out, like what is going on here? And so me being the man, great man of faith that I was and expecting it to hurt, I said, well, t Aaron, tell me this hurt, Aaron. And I kicked her in the foot. I, sw I honestly did. Not really hard, but kicked her in the foot. And she goes, ow, that hurt. I'm like, well, see, see, you're not healed. She goes, no, but that would have hurt my other foot too. Like you just, that hurt. I'm like, I'm sorry. Like, listen, I'm kind of freaking out right now. Take the crutches, put them away, and don't tell anybody that I prayed for you. So, it was, it was amazing. I prayed for other people after that. That's what, what it started from a prophetic word. And it started with that word having a, fi a fire in me. It started burning in me. I couldn't stop thinking about it. And I couldn't stop thinking, about, well, what does this mean for my life? How can I keep going forward in this school if I can't promote this or can't talk about this or we, we can't do these things? And so later on, this man came from, I don't know where he's from, but he spoke about the Welsh revivals. And he started talking about revival and, and people getting saved by the hundreds of thousands of people through uh, driving, couldn't even drive through the community in a car or a boat couldn't go by the harbor without uh, stopping in the, and pulling up to the, just repenting and receiving Christ. Because the atmosphere they had created through prayer, it just so permeated the area that people were getting saved just driving by. Amazing. I never heard stories like that. And my spirit started to burn again. And many people in the school, their spirit started to burn. So we started getting together in the morning and the evening, early in the morning, to pray, just a group of people. And my dad couldn't believe it. He's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm going for early morning prayer. And he goes, why? <laughs> it's, like, it's like 7 a.m. or 7.30. You always sleep in except on class days. Like, I don't know. I just have to go pray. I just want to pray. He's like, man, you are changed. I bless you in Jesus' name. He said, you are changed. God has done something in you. And so we started going every morning. We started going every evening. We started praying together in groups. And four or five, sometimes ten, sometimes it got up to, I think, close to 30. And uh, we're praying in my basement every night because uh, I lived on, uh, close to the school with the guys. And wild things started happening in my basement. Stuff I never saw on TV. Stuff I never read about in books. Crazy things. Like uh, some, one of my friends started manifesting a demon. And... Uh, I was like, never saw this before. Didn't think my buddy had a demon. He was on the basketball team with me. We were pretty close. He's, he's manifesting big time on the floor. And I was just like, the only verse I could think of was like to go find some pigs. So that's what I said. In the name of Jesus, leave him and go find some pigs. And he just stopped like that. I'm like, yeah, it worked. Praise <laughs> God. I was as shocked as anybody. And, uh, but he, he got totally delivered. I remember that same night, my mom yelled down and said, what are you guys doing down there? It sounds like you're casting out a demon. I said, we are, Mom. She goes, oh, well, well, can you keep it down some, please? We're trying to, I'm like, I'll try to keep it down, Mom. This is my first time, but I don't know if you've ever tried to cast a demon before, but it's, sometimes it can be noisy. I'm sorry. So, um, so anyway, uh, I remember my mom came down one night, asked for prayer. Bless you in Jesus' name. She came down one night, asked for prayer, and I prayed for my mom. And uh, I can't even remember what she wanted to pray for. And my mom fell out under the power of God. I was totally stunned. I was like, what is going on? I didn't know what was going on, but I knew it was really fun. I was like, this is fun. Like, this, like, it, it wasn't a work. It wasn't, it was just fun. And, and my mother had another lady come. She, she told, my mother told this lady that I prayed for Aaron, who was healed. Because I told no one to tell, but I told my mom. And then she told her, and I got mad at mom for telling. Because I was still trying to process, uh, how did this happen? And so one night I came home from school. I had, a, I had a discipleship class I was doing with these young men in the community, and uh, it was a T.D. Jakes video, I remember that. I was showing this video, I loved this video, it was really good, and I stopped it just in time, because at the end of the video, they show some people praying in tongues in the video. I'm like, I'm going to stop this before that happens, because I know that's going to tick these kids off. They're all professors, kids, and uh, uh, the president's son was in there, and a bunch of ones like that, and they're all teenagers. 
So I stopped it. I'm like, why'd you stop it? Well, the video's over. I'm like, it didn't look like it was over. I'm like, nah, it's over. We'll just we'll just talk about what you thought, what you thought, what his teaching was, and stuff. Go, no, why don't you play a few more minutes? So I'm like, I get peer pressured into it, and I I did. I played a few more minutes, and then afterwards, like, why did I play a few more minutes? Because they all were like, rah, 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 and they didn't like it, and they're just like, I told you, you wouldn't like it. That's why I stopped it. So I went home. I was that's what I was feeling when I went home, and then I walk in the door, kind of feeling like this, and there's this lady jumping out and saying her name is Debbie, and she's like, Hey, I heard you pray for Aaron's foot, uh, and she was healed. Will you pray for me? I have MS, and I have I can't remember what other things she said she had, and I was just I was not in the mood for praying for anybody. I was still kind of ticked off because I showed that video and I was a little deflated. So I said, um, Yeah, I'll, I'll pray for you. How about uh, next uh, next Tuesday or next Thursday? How's that sound? And she looked at me kind of shocked and puzzled. She goes, okay, I can come back next Tuesday or Thursday if that's better for you. I was like, yeah, I think that's better for me. And so I started walking down the stairs to my room, and God says to me, next Tuesday? He's like, you pray for her now. I felt like this kind of scolding almost like, do it now. I'm like, I don't feel like it right now. I'm kind of upset. I don't know if you've noticed, but <laughs> these guys were really mad back there over this thing. And um, he goes, you're not the one who heals her. I'm the one who heals her. I just need you to pray for her and touch her. I was like, all right, I'll do it. <laughs> it's like it's the whole guilt thing. I was, it, was not, it was not the love for her. It was, it was fear. Because religion causes fear-based relationship with, with God. God doesn't lead us through fear. He leads us through love and faith. But anyway, so I called a few buddies to come down to my house to help me pray for this lady named Debbie. And we started praying for her, and she started falling out under the power of God. And we, and this is before I'd prayed for my mom that time. She started falling back, and I was like, but she stopped herself. It was really kind of funny. She'd go like that, and she stopped herself. And I was like, what are you doing? I was so innocent and naive. I had no clue. I'd never seen Benny Hinn on TV. I'd never seen, I'd never been to any Pentecostal-type meeting where anyone fell down. Didn't know anything about it. And uh, she, kept, she goes, well, I... Uh, I'm stopping myself from falling. Like, yeah, I can see that, but why are you doing it? She goes, I don't know. I, she goes, I've always made fun of that stuff. My whole life I've made fun of it. I said, you made fun of what? She goes, falling down. Like, you mean people do that? Where where do they do that? She goes, you know, Benny Hinn. And that. Like, who's Benny Hinn? I had no idea who he was. I mean, we didn't have cable most of the time growing up for me. I didn't, we just, we didn't. So uh, anyway, um, so we started praying for Debbie, and, I, and the Spirit of God spoke through me amazingly. He said, I said to her, well, we're not pushing you, are we? And she goes, no, you're definitely not pushing me. I said, well, if maybe if you're resisting, since we're not pushing you, maybe you're resisting what God's doing. And if you're resisting something that God's doing, maybe you're not going to receive all that he wants to have for you. I was like, man, that was, I was thinking later, that was really amazing. <laughs> I knew that must have been God. So uh, we stepped back and started praying for her. We are probably five, six feet away, just kind of stretching our hands towards her, just, just, just so you know we're not pushing you. But don't resist. I don't care if you fall. I did no grid for that. But if you do, fall. Like, whatever. <laughs> so uh, we started praying for her. And I, it was before I learned to watch and pray. Like Jesus said, watch and pray. I was close my eyes and pray because that's what I was taught. You can't look around. Yeah, It's a rule. You have to have your eyes closed or your prayers will not work. You know, it's, no, it's not a, not a thing. So anyway, I uh, was praying for her. And, and my friends were praying for her. And I'm just enjoying God's presence. That's all I was really remember doing. I was just enjoying his presence. His presence was on me. His presence was in the room. And next thing, I opened my eyes, and she was probably about halfway down falling. And I was like, oh, no, I probably should catch her. I never saw anyone caught, kept being caught before anything either. I reached out to catch her, and I put my hands to catch her, and I felt no weight in my hands. Now, she was a medium-sized lady. She wasn't a string bean or big, but she was somewhere in between. Praise God. <laughs> it's hard to say. <laughs> I don't know how to say that, but I would have felt her. I mean, if, I, mean I would have felt, I mean, you'd feel a child, a child's falling. You would have, I would I felt no weight in my hands, and she she fell onto the floor, and I was just like, yeah, this is amazing. What was that? What was that? What just happened? I was, like, so excited. And so she laid on the floor for a while, praying, just receiving from God. And then she, uh, after a while, got up, and I asked her, just out of curiosity, did you feel me catch you? She goes, no. She said, nobody caught me. It felt like angels laid me down. I'm like, oh, that's what I felt, too. That was awesome. And, you know, when her back hit the floor, her spine went straight. She had a curvature in her spine and some other things. Her back went straight, and she has a x-ray before and after. And I just wonder, like, what would have happened if she would have said, nope, I'm not going to fall down. I'm, I'm going to resist what God's doing. I'm going to whatever. I don't know. But uh, God started moving and moving, and more and more people started getting touched, and more and more people started getting changed, and more people started getting filled with the Spirit. 
uh, as we kept praying night after night, every night, someone started telling me the Baptist Holy Spirit and praying in tongues. And I thought, what's that? That's in the Bible? Like, I, I didn't even know. I had no grid for that. So I started studying that, the way I studied healing. And, you know, it's in there a lot, too. It probably is not as much as healing, but it's in there a lot more than I thought it would be. Um, it definitely should be taught in a four-year Bible college. There definitely should have been room for teaching on these verses. There's a lot of them. So anyway, I started praying for this and asking God, like, how come, how, how come you, this happened in Acts 2 and other places in the Bible? I see how it had a big impact on other people. But today, like, I don't know anything about this. No one talks about this. So anyway, one night I'm praying, and I, I didn't fall out in the Spirit. I just I was at my house. I laid on the floor. And I was just, just soaking in God's presence, just enjoying God's presence, being with God. And my friend from Kenya was there, and he came over and laid his hand on my belly. And he started praying for me. I think in tongues, but the guy, he really did know it's like seven languages. But I think it was tongues. started praying for me. And all of a sudden, out of my belly started flowing rivers of living water. And it wasn't just like a, a trickle, like a woof, just like this power and anointing came out of me. And it was absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. Um... The very next day, I went to church at this, um, it was a four-square church, I believe, with a friend of mine. And I didn't even, I didn't know anybody there. I didn't say hi to anybody. And people just kept walking up to me and talking to me like, you, did you just recently get baptized in the Holy Spirit or something? Because there's just this glow about you. There's just something. I go, yeah, just last night, actually. <laughs> and it was just amazing. And um, the power of God has the ability to, to change your life. You know, I had, to, I had to go to my dad. I had to go to my grandfather and say, I can't stay in this denomination. I'm sorry. I, I don't mean any disrespect, but I've now been baptized in the Holy Spirit. God's used me to pray for people. They're getting healed, something this denomination doesn't do. And I don't want to split a church over this these issues, but I cannot possibly not promote something that's absolutely changed my life. It, I went from, yeah, I read the Bible before. I did. I had to read it for class. I had to read it all the time. Well, after I was baptized in the Holy Spirit and had these encounters with God, it was like I was reading it for the very first time. Like, these spiritual scales fell off my eyes, and I'd just seen things that I'd never seen before. And I went from just being a normal, casual Christian to someone who's on fire for God and wanted to pray all the time and wanted to minister to people, wanted to do these things I was scared of doing before. I'm not telling you these stories to brag on me. I didn't do anything. I, I, God did everything. He, he, but the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not a Pentecostal theology. It's not a Bap, Baptist theology. It's not a Wesleyan, which I was in, or Presbyterian theology. It's the Bible. And it says, Acts, I think it's Acts 2.33, that Jesus was the one who received from the Father what was poured out, what they saw and heard. Jesus, the smiling Jesus right here, he poured out on the 120 what they saw and heard. And I think sometimes, if you're like me, had a background like mine, you're told that this isn't important, or that's not important, or this is just for certain people, if they're holy enough, or if they're this enough, or whatever. Enough. And it's just not true. The same way we can't earn grace, the same way you can't earn your salvation, is the same way you can't earn any of the gifts. Their grace gift. The word charismatic comes from the word charisma, comes from the word charis, which means grace. It all is a work of grace. And I'm telling you, we all need a fresh touch of the baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire. I can't live on what happened to me in 1995 or 1996 and going forward. And you can't live on what happened in the 70s from here when Adger's dad preached on the baptism of the Holy Spirit here. We need fresh fillings, refillings of the Holy Spirit. We do. We just do. Amen. I bless you in Jesus' name. I bless you in Jesus' name. Holly, why don't you come up here and share um, a encounter you've had with God in Brazil, from Brazil or from wherever. I'm feeling pretty encountered right now, actually. <laughs> Woo. Oh. He's stirring something.
I'm telling you. I'm feeling it so strong right now. Woo. Um, the first time well, I saw Randy Clark doing that, uh, I bless you in Jesus' name, but I have been contending to be healed from gluten sensitivity. Um, and we went to Brazil, that was 08, and um, I had been in the lunch line with this other girl, and she had celiac disease. And so we were both, you know, looking, what can we eat, what can we not eat? And there wasn't much, especially the breakfast buffet, you know, it's all pastries and breads and a um, little bit of fruit and a little bit of this or that that's not. But um, so in the service, Randy Clark was speaking, my spirit just started burning so strong. And I kept waiting like, oh, I'll be polite. I'll wait till he has a little pause in what he's saying. And he never paused. He just kept going and going. So I'm like, it was almost painful for me to just wait any longer. So finally, I just had to stand up. And um, he's like, I bless you in Jesus' name. And um, it felt like a lightning bolt from heaven just came down and hit me and went all the way through me. And um, so I knew that I knew God touched me. And that was one definite encounter I've had with the Lord. Yeah, and so that that lunch I went, and I'm standing in the line, and I look over, and there's the girl who'd struggled with celiac disease also. And so I'm like, told her my encounter. She's like, I had the same thing happen to me. And she's like, I'm ready to test it out. I'm like, me too. So we each got like one little thing um, that had gluten in it, and we tried it. Fine, nothing wrong. So the next, as it progressed and as our time there, we get a little more and a little more, and we were just rejoicing together like, praise God, we are totally healed. Amen. So it doesn't have to be a big encounter like that, but it can be. And God wants to show himself powerful and mighty on your behalf. Amen. And um, so encountering him like that is just fun. So, and it's undeniable. Like, I could not deny what I experienced. And then, of course, the fruits of it after where I had no symptoms eating any food after that. Um, other than gaining weight, maybe. <laughs> I need some healing there. No. Um, anyways, but actually that whole trip was a marker for me of encountering God and God encountering me. And um, so there was just beautiful times of worship um, where we would just like fall out in the presence. Sometimes we would just choose to lay on the floor and just soak in his presence. And I felt like um, just different times, like my body would be doing different things. Like one time my hand just kept closing and I was like, well, what is going on, God? And um, I just felt him say like, oh, you're, you have my hand, I've got you. And um, just felt like we were holding hands. So even sometimes now in worship, when I've got my hand closed. I'm not closing myself off to him. I'm just picturing myself seated with him in heavenly places and grabbing onto his hand in worship. And um, so even one time, our whole group went up for prayer. And and there was more. Up on the stage, they called um, anybody in worship teams. And so our youth had a band, a worship team back then. And so we all went up and they prayed. And the glory of God hit every single person that was on that stage. Every single person fell out, boom, together. It was no catchers, no nothing. And um, it was, I don't even know how to describe it, but it was awesome. When we got up later, um, we were just covered in gold dust, which I'd never even heard of before. Um, but it was just the glory of God on display, and it was beautiful. Um, are there any questions for me? Which one? No. Okay, well, here's a fun one. Are you ready for more weird? <laughs> okay, I don't even know what time it is. But it's just fun. Life with God is fun. Okay, you can have boring church in and out. You can have that. But if you want the more, there's more. And it's fun. It's awesome. Some people will think you're crazy. But like I said earlier, I cannot deny what I have experienced and seen, felt, heard. Um, and they're life-changing. But um, one time, I was just sitting at home. 
I know I've shared all these stories before, but they're good. But doing the nursery schedule, nothing real spiritual, just working on the nursery schedule. And Ryan was sitting in the living room also, and all of a sudden I was like, whoo! He's like, what? And I said, well, I don't know. You might think I'm crazy, but I just felt something. And um, I believe I felt an angel wing. And it was the weirdest but coolest thing. You know how you can run your finger over a feather and it's like like that? And also, if you can picture a cat, if you had a cat that came up and its tail kind of curled up, under your nose, like we're to tickle your nose. That's what I experienced. This, I believe, was an angel wing came up under me, it tickled my nose, and I could, it was about an inch thick. I could feel it brushing up against my nose. I could feel all the little parts going under my nose, and it startled me. And so I was like, why do you think that happened? <laughs> And he'd go, Ryan's like, I don't know, I guess just God showing himself real to you, maybe having fun with you. Um, but even that, I wasn't seeking after him for some big sign and wonder. I wasn't looking for some big miracle, but just God just having fun with me. And I can't explain that. I don't know why, um, but it was notable, like very notable. Um, so, and we sing that song, I bless you in Jesus' name. Whoa, yes. Woo, more Lord. Ha, whoa. Woo. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> no, well, that's all Brazil. Who wants to sign up? <laughs> I didn't do that whoa thing before. That 2008 trip was a marker in so many different ways. <laughs> But, um, yeah, I had uh, uh, words of knowledge. That was new for us, going back to Brazil and how I started that, feeling the Holy Spirit in those ways. But um, this girl had a prophetic word. They were all lined up at the stage, and um, they gave their prophetic words, and my heart kind of started burning. I'm like, her prophetic word was something about those little 70s canisters that used to be on the countertops of lots of little grandma's homes with the mushroom top and <laughs> orange and white. They're collector items now. But um, so I was like, well, I kind of think that's for me because my grandma had those on the counter at our cottage. I love our cottage. love my grandma. Our whole heritage. But I was like, but I'm not, you know, I'm not seeking God for anything special. So what does that mean? So I kind of just weighed it, thinking maybe it's for somebody else. Well, nobody went up to her. Everyone else got paired up with who was giving prophetic words. So then the people sat down to pray, and the girl went over and sat by herself, and I kept feeling like, maybe it's for me. So I went over, and I shared with her, hey, when you said this, I saw, remembered my grandmother, had these on the counter, and she's like, well, awesome. Well, let me pray for you. So she was just praying in general, like, you know, Lord, touch her. We don't know why you had this word. And um, so I went up, and or I was just receiving, and as she's praying for me, she's doing this, like, whoa, kind of a deal. And I was like, why do you do that? <laughs> And she said the same thing, like, well, somebody here prayed for me, and this is what she was doing. And then all of a sudden, I started doing it, and I feel the Holy Ghost, and I've been feeling them stronger and stronger. And so wouldn't you know, guess who starts doing that after she prayed for me? <laughs> so anyways, again, not that you have to do anything like that or not, or not that you can turn it on or off. I don't know. <laughs> but um, just sometimes I get those waves of the Holy Spirit, like, just hit me, hit me now. And... Um, so, yeah. <laughs> so it's fun. We also had some crazy encounters and um, intercession, especially in that 08 trip. And um, so I still want to take another teen group there, just FYI, sometime, and maybe adult trip too. So if that's burning in your heart, let's pray about it and see. I know things have been a little weird since COVID, but... I don't know. There's something special about that place and also just being under Randy Clark's authority because he walks in a lot of neat signs and wonders and miracles. Thank you. 
I remember I was talking to Dick Robinson this week, Gerald, and he asked about, yes, how you're doing everything. I said, he's doing great. And um, the first time Dick Robinson came here, do you remember what year was that, Gerald? It was in the 90s probably, right? Probably in the 90s. Yeah. So um, Dick had just been to Toronto and received a touch from the Lord. And he was going to different churches ministering. He was touching, praying for people, and they were falling out in the power and having encounters with God. And uh, he was asking who wanted prayer, and he, he he said he told me just like it was yesterday. And Gerald was back at the church walking in circles, and he goes, and he looked angry. He goes, I don't know what was going on. He, goes, he looked angry. I was kind of scared. Like, is this guy mad at me for what I'm saying right now, or or what's going on? He could I couldn't read his mind. And I guess he was just whatever, just pacing, asking God questions or whatever. And then he came up, and Dick prayed for him, and boom, he fell under the power of God. I guess over here, wasn't it? And uh, was it this side? Okay, somewhere where Mar- okay, where Marshall is. And he was out for, I think it was an hour and a half or something like that, right? And Susan went home to feed the girls, and Gerald's still gone, laying here on the floor. Cause, uh, but that had a big impact on your life, didn't it, Gerald? Yeah. And then from that, uh, you, it was your idea to have Dick Robinson go back years later, which had a major impact on my life. Um, in ministry that he did with me, the deliverance and stuff like that. And... Um, you know, God's ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are in our thoughts. And not everything he does is logical. Not everything he does is reasonable. Not everything he does is scientific. Some things he does are just different. And, and um, I was like, what was that? <laughs> I, was like, I, was like, I was like, double different. I was like, <laughs> I was like okay. <laughs> Praise God. I want to tell one more story. And I want to pray for some people. But... um. In our, in our youth group, we met every Wednesday night. And especially after Brazil, we started having these amazing times and encounters with God. And we go up there in the youth room, and it was so intense sometimes that parents wanted to come, and other people from other churches started coming. And it was just God's presence. It was just God's presence in the room. And Marshall got radically touched there. A lot of what you see on Sundays when Marshall's leading worship, is a 100% direct result what happened in the upper room, in our youth room. I mean, 100%. I mean, God met him there, Patrick there, all of us, Casey, Seth, Meredith, everyone, the whole group that was involved. And um, night after night after night, we were having these amazing experiences with God. I remember one time Patrick had a vision of going to heaven. I bless you in Jesus' name. He had a vision of going to heaven. And he, he saw, like, all these people behind him. And God asked him, who are these people behind you? And he's, he didn't even know there was anyone was behind him. And he's like, I don't know. And then he tells him, these are all the people you're going to lead to the Lord. And he had prophetic words about speaking into, I think it was like 50 nations and things like that in different places. <laughs> so uh, don't be afraid of that either. Sometimes that happens. Sometimes it's just being, you're being electrocuted by the glory of God. And it's, it doesn't have to happen, but sometimes it does. It really does. So... Um, but we have night after night of people coming in there, kids coming in that were said they're atheists. And then by the time they left, they're getting saved. And it wasn't because I had the best sermon ever. It was the power of God, the presence of God. I remember Christian uh, Haithcock, I think his name was, uh, one night feeling he was a kid, grew up in a children's home, had issues at home. His parents had a, abandonment things, all kinds of stuff on him. And he was just feeling unloved and un, uh, just worthy and all these things. And I was just like, in Jesus' name, I put my hand on his chest, and that kid just fell back and just started weeping and sobbing and sobbing under the power of God as God was touching and healing these real wounds that people have in real life. I remember Dick Robinson telling a story at his church in, was it Ronalda, I think, Presbyterian? And uh, somewhere in Raleigh, right? Winston, Salem, okay, Winston, and it's a big church from what I heard, and uh, he was right after he came back from Toronto, and there was people doing what Laura's doing here, and there's people falling out, and there's all kinds of things going on that people are just like, this is too weird for me, and you know, sometimes it is, sometimes I gotta tell you the truth, it's too weird, it's been a little too weird for me sometimes too, but it doesn't mean it's not God, and uh, and so, uh, uh, which story was I telling, oh yeah, uh, so there was guests in the front row, and these people are falling out and having these encounters with God as Dick Robinson's praying for him. And people are thought, oh, that's going to offend people. That's going to 
People are going to leave because they're offended. They're not going to come back. And the two visitors were leaning over the, their pew, looking and watching because they were hungry for something real, a power of God. Why has it become acceptable that people can walk into church and expect nothing, receive nothing, no life's touched or changed, but yet when someone when God does show up and touch someone's life or something happens, that's the bad thing? Why is it not bad that nothing's happening? Why is it not bad that lives aren't being touched and transformed? Why is it not bad that people aren't having fire encounters with God that radically touch and change their life? Why is passionless Christianity okay? Why are, we, why are we ashamed to preach the gospel of Jesus? Why are we ashamed of this? I bless you, Maddie, in Jesus' name. Didn't know if you stand up for it. Well, bless you anyway. <laughs> in Jesus' name. Uh, why is that okay? You know what? It's religion says that's okay. When you're passionate about something, I had this idea yesterday. Maybe we should come some Sunday morning. We put on our, our uh, favorite football outfits or soccer outfits or hockey jerseys, whatever, get our faces painted. But we do it in honor of Jesus. We have a already celebrating passionate worship of Jesus because he's the one who deserves our passionate praise and worship. Amen? Not a football game or basketball game or anything else. But yet, you look at how weird people act in those meetings sometimes. I was watching hockey the other night, and this guy had this face paint on, and I'm just like, it looked hideous. I was just thinking, like, this guy looks crazy. I mean, it looks crazy. And that's normal because he's a fanatic. He's a fan. And, yet, and then we go into church, and we might have a fanatic, someone who's passionate about Jesus, and something happens. That's not okay. No, it should be the normal. And, you know, and if people get offended when they come into our church, it's not my goal. It's not my goal. For people to get offended, it's not my goal that people have necessarily this encounter or that encounter. But my goal is reality in the spirit realm. My goal is freedom. And if, if we have to be mature enough, because I'm telling you, there's days coming where it isn't going to be just one person uh, shaking and twitching under the power of God. It's all through church history. I can show you book after book. This is not new. It happened all through the Bible. And it says they were acting like drunk men in Acts 2. So something was going on where people outside thought they were drunk. So it sometimes happens. But... We need to be okay with that. And not okay with it, celebrate it. Not just tolerate it like, oh, I'm not offended. I'm a real Christian. I'm not offended. No, let's celebrate it. If God's really doing that, if they're faking, then I'll have to deal with that. But if it's something real that God's doing, he's delivering them from drugs. He's delivering them from alcohol. Bless you in Jesus' name. He's delivering them from something. He's delivering them. He's bringing freedom to them. Patrick Wise, again, he, he shook harder than anyone I'd ever seen before. Just grew up just down the road here in Avery Hill. Never saw anyone shake like that before. We're going through a fire tunnel. Never heard of fire tunnels. Again, 2008. And I was asked to be the catcher. It was all marble flooring. So I, th I thought, well, I better do a good job or someone's going to get hurt. This is all hard marble floor. Never seen it. And people are falling out like crazy. It was all like, what is going on? It was wild to me. And I was kind of glad I was the catcher and not the one going through the line because I was still trying to figure out what I believed about some of this stuff. Anyway, and so... The guy said, help, help catch this guy quick. He's, he's falling, and I don't want him to fall on this person. So this person falls, and they're shaking like crazy. The, their leg is shaking like so hard and fast. He goes, don't let their leg hit that person in the head who's already on the ground. Does it sound like chaos? Yeah, it does sound like a little chaos, but it was uh, God's version of decently and in order. Decently in order has become a religious phrase of let's do nothing and be dignified about it and praise God with our dignified stuff. And people go home and nothing's changed in their life. So Patrick's on the ground. This is, this is, this is the one for me that I needed to see that helped me like, okay, God, I'm, I'm all in. I'm all in. This guy's shaking so, so hard, his legs. His cowboy boots flew off. You know how hard it is to put cowboy boots on and off? I mean, <laughs> it doesn't even matter if they're too big or too small. They're, they're hard to get on. They went flying off, and I, finally he rolled over, shaking, I bless you in Jesus' name. And it was Patrick. And I was like, oh my gosh, this stuff is real. Because up until that point, I was thinking, these guys are all faking. This is not real. Why would God do that? God would not do that. That's, that's crazy. Why would God do something like that? But well, guess what? We don't have the grid on God. We don't have the corner on God. We know everything about God. We will never know everything about God. We know in part. We prophesy in part. And God says, I am the Lord your God, and I do what I want. <laughs> and sometimes we need these weird experiences like I had or Holly had or Patrick had, Marshall had, many of us had before. We need not the normal. We need something super normal, supernatural to put fire back in our lives so that, that these things have to matter. Amen. So um, I'm just going to wait for a minute and pray and see if 
Do you have another story? or? Oh, I bless you, Cleveland, in Jesus' name. Did you have something else, sir? God, we don't understand all this stuff. I don't know that we're supposed to. We're supposed to, but we are supposed to judge by the fruit. So God, have your way. We don't know how to fix things or we would have fixed them already. We don't know how to make ourselves become on fire or any of these things. We need your help. We need you, God. He said it was to our benefit that you go away. So you could send the Holy Spirit to be our helper, our comforter, our consoler, our advocate. We hope you enjoyed today's message. If you have any questions or would like prayer, please contact us by calling the number on the screen or email us at disciplingnations at plumtreechurch.com.